digital cutting edge of uh, this university and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of that. Um, I'm also, it's also the perfect timing uh, for, for this talk uh, because actually um, just last week, uh, uh, a special issue in organization studies, which is one of the what's most important journals in my discipline, has been published uh, with, uh, with actually where I borrowed the title from. Uh, it's about a special issue on open organizing, open society, and about openness as an organizing principle. And the history of this uh, special issue is actually dates 10 years back. Then when I, together with colleagues from, from Oxford and ETH Zurich, we applied for, for our first conference sub-theme on openness, not restricted to one's domain of openness. I will talk about this in a second, but rather more generally, open organizing, open organizing practices. Uh, is it possible to theorize across different areas of applications? Then we had four such sub-themes over the years and we had our call for a special issue. And then in the end, 10 years later, uh, the special issue was published. And, uh, and this is the first talk afterwards that I'm giving uh, using uh, this title. And yeah, so um, it's kind of, a, I would say, hopefully not the end point of a debate, but I would say, uh, for me at least, a very important milestone of, um, yeah, bring actually the openness uh, debate, which is, of course, already uh, more than two decades old, I would say, really uh, to, this, to the heart of also organization studies. Um, when I talk, uh, the subtitle of my talk reads Dilemmas Across Domains, and also in my introductory statement, I uh, referred to the fact that op there are several domains where openness is discussed, where open approaches are suggested. One of the most important ones that all of us are concerned with is, of course, science itself. Yeah, we all heard about First, open access, then open science, yeah, as one domain where openness is suggested uh, or supposed to play a bigger role. Uh, but even prior to open science, there were, and I'm at the disk, so everyone is familiar with the concept of open source, <laughs> open source software, uh, which actually emerged under the label of free software. I don't need to explain this in this audience uh, in the early in the 1980s, but actually I would say it became really relevant over the mid-1990s with the advent of the internet. So you're all familiar with that. But um, what a colleague of mine, Nathaniel Kutch, wrote in an article 2012 already was that he was curious about actually this, what he called the second coming of openness, yeah? open source software, but then also open innovation. I'm going to uh, give some examples in a minute. But that he was curious about why this um, openness of, of organizations uh, was so attractive, why we could observe the second coming of openness in an uh, supposedly already open society. Yeah? Here referencing, of course, Karl Popper. So what he refers to the second coming was first of all open source coined in the mid 1990s to make the free software approach more compatible actually with business. Then uh, soon thereafter, open access, you know, the, the idea that everyone should have access to at least publicly funded research results. Uh, then this was transferred to the sphere of education, also relevant to all of us here at the university, I guess, open education resources, trying to make available research materials um, for free online for everyone, and not just for free in the sense of free in the sense of free beer, to quote Richard Stallman, but uh, free in the sense of free speech. So allowing others to build on this education material, to reuse it, to remix it, to reshare it. And then uh, in 2003, the open, um, the open label was, I would say, transplanted into the business realm and became a management fad. <laughs> uh, so uh, mostly Henry Jasper is credited with having achieved this with his book in 2003 on open innovation. Actually, there have been several different flavors of open innovation in the business sphere. I'm sure many of you have heard about Eric von Hippel, who coined the term democratizing innovation. And <clears throat> there was some debate whether these are different perspectives on, on openness, but both of them were situated in the innovation realm. Then, as we can observe very often, once a, a management fad becomes popular in the business field, so a little later, uh, such fads end up also in the public sphere. So what then emerged was the idea of open government, also accompanied by ideas of open data. And most recently, actually, um, uh, the term open strategy had been 
coined, had been established for more open approaches to leadership, to management, to strategically governing organizations in both public and private sector uh, in general. So actually, the, interestingly, the colleagues here at the University of uh, Innsbruck who managed something that, um, uh, that I actually I could not do and I would uh, maybe not even want to do, but they really managed to write the um, practitioner's book on the topic. Yeah? Kurt Matzler, Julia Hautz and others, they wrote the practitioner's book on open strategy, they received a lot of prices, they get, so they really, now actually openness has really arrived as a consulting concept with this book. So, and uh, so what they argue at the back side, uh, at the back cover of, of the book is how smart companies are opening up strategic initiatives to involve frontline employees, experts, suppliers, customers, entrepreneurs, and even competitors. You know, we as open source cracks, we know that cooperating with you know competitors on the label of openness or actually more on the fund uh, based on the uh, fundament of uh, an open source software license is not alien yeah? uh, but uh, in the when we talk about strategy where it's much um, where, where, where a lot of people have always thought about something that is that has to differentiate that, that, that is about competitive advantage that's maybe more pro provocative here okay so one can say with open strategy, it really has, um, uh, the concept of openness has reached the C-suit, the management suit. Um, but what all these approaches, all these approaches, open source, to open innovation, to open government, to open strategy, what, all they, what, what they all have in common is that they share a certain affirmative perspective on openness as something good, as something that needs to be increased, as something that needs to be achieved. So what, what I would want to summarize these different domains of openness or fields of application or however you want to call it, I would say this is understanding openness as a program, yeah, as a um, as something uh, that you work towards. And uh, this, there are also uh, several conceptualizations, but mostly openness is here seen as the opposite of closure, yeah, maybe as endpoints of a continuum yeah, that runs from the closed to the open organization and organizations or um, that are suggested to yeah, maybe try to move a little bit closer to the point of openness along this continuum by inviting more actors to the table, uh, by sharing more information. So the, the, the terms here are inbound and outbound openness, inbound taking more external knowledge in, outbound openness sharing more knowledge, more information with the outside, and becoming more open, either inbound or outbound, is considered to be a normative ideal. And of course, um, not everything is fun and games, also in this literature. Yeah. So uh, of course, if, if organizations say, okay, we want to become more open, we want to change our processes accordingly, um, tensions are very likely to arise, and there's a lot of research on these tensions. Yeah? So tensions such as more openness might compromise decision-making speed, if we talk about strategy, or that um, you might burden wider audiences with the pressures of actually taking part in strategy in addition to their ordinary jobs, which, are, which is not such as in management making strategy, yeah? but rather if you invite ordinary employees, ordinary employees into the strategy-making process, some of them might, be, might feel that that's an additional task they have now uh, to do, uh, in addition to all the workload that they are collapsing under anyhow. Um, but more or less, all these tensions and problems, they are considered to some to be limitations or hurdles on the way of, to, towards greater openness. So they are not putting into question the normative perspective on openness as something good. Um, so what's interesting in this context is that while openness is considered to be something you want to achieve, when, uh, with, when, when you look at this literature, um, the way it is defined, at least in the first place, is very fuzzy, to put it mildly. Yeah? What's clear is that openness is the other way of organizing, other compared to what has previously been done. Yeah? So, for example, here, Jasper and Appleyard, in one of the first papers on open strategy, coming out of an open innovation mindset, they write, open strategy balances the tenets of traditional business strategy with the promise 
of open innovation. So again, it's the traditional business and then openness is different from traditional. Or um, Whittington in a later paper, they argue that strategy is traditionally exclusive. Opacity is important to strategy. Open strategy challenges both these orthodoxies. So being less exclusive and less opaque, more transparent, but how and what this exactly means is not so clear. Yeah? So openness is here an open and here no, no pun intended, <laughs> conceptual uh, frame to evaluate, adapt, change, and alter established corporate structures or clusters of uh, organizational routines, uh, as one could say. What is the consequence of this negative definition of openness? Negative not in the sense that it's a bad thing. I think I made this clear. It's considered to be a very good thing, but it's defined in a negative sense as not closed. Yeah? So this means it allows both researchers and uh, practitioners to fill it as it suits their own interests or needs. Yeah? So for example, it allows uh, a practice that is called, now I'm uh, speaking about literature and research on open source software, on selective revealing. You, mean, you, know, you can choose uh, what you reveal, which makes you more open than people who, or organizations that reveal nothing, but it's, it's you have got the choice. Yeah? So the, the routines related to this selective revealing routines are licensing routines, yeah, open licensing, or also uh, Jasper even considers licensing in any form to be more open than not licensing. Yeah? So even if it's not an open source software license, but rather if you're licensing your own technologies to others, this is already considered to be open uh, in the sense of Chesbro's concept of open innovation or reintegrating external knowledge. It allows selective inclusion if we talk about people, including more actors into your internal processes. Uh, so you might um, invite certain people to solicit ideas, others to deliberate ideas or to make even uh, decisions. It might also allow for, and I will come back to that, open washing. Uh, a former PhD student of mine, Max Heimstedt, he wrote a paper on open washing in the field of open data, uh, where he dis distinguishes several different types of uh, what institutionalists call decoupling. Yeah? So you erect the facade of openness, but then what actually happens behind this facade uh, is also uh, not so clear. Yeah? So uh, how open, uh, how, how much openness actually happens or whether only very selective certain forms of openness are pursued um, without fulfilling for, for example, certain accountability promises that are often associated with openness and transparency. Okay, so um, what uh, this kind of negative definition of openness and this uh, different uh, ways of, of, of operationalizing openness in organizational contexts imply is the first of three dilemmas, because that was the title of my talk, dilemmas across domains. And what I would argue is that these dilemmas I'm going to talk about now, that they can be found in all of these different domains. You will find them in open science, as you will find them in open innovation, you will find them in open uh, strategy, and so on. And the first I would say is the, uh, what I would call the dilemma of normativity, uh, meaning that since uh, these open um, approaches that I talked about, approaches that they are um, affirmative and they are normative, you also have to take a normative stance if you promise to get more open. And um, in the literature, at least, the normative anchors for uh, organizing openness, uh, that openness is ev evaluated towards or that are meant to be achieved with openness is transparency and inclusion. So becoming more transparent or more inclusive. So if you look at openness as transparency, um, here giving an, an, again an example from the, the realm of open strategy, uh, in terms of transparency, it means uh, both in the strategy formulation stage and more commonly the communication of strategy once they are formulated. So be more transparent about who is involved in making the strategy, where the input is solicited from, and then sharing uh, the results openly, at least within the organization, but maybe even with uh, competitors outside. If we talk about openness as inclusion, inclusion refers to the participation um, in an uh, organization's strategic conversation, meaning who is allowed to be part, for example, of a strategic uh, conversation, but the same is true for open innovation, who is allowed to contribute ideas or uh, to take part in the innovation process. So what we here have is routines of 
collecting, deliberating, and consider and condensing, for example, strategic ideas, or maybe even decision-making routines. So to give one more example from the, the one more quote from this seminal paper by Whittington and others on open strategy, they then define open forms of strategy making uh, with um, more transparency inside and outside and more inclusion of different actors internally and externally. This then leads them to kind of some form of, um, one could say, yeah, continuum as I said before. So you can start becoming more transparent by informing more about how you make strategy, what are the outcomes. You might even survey people to give inputs. You might even engage in dialogue with a broader uh, uh, populace. And uh, in the end, you might even include them in, in kind of voting-like behaviors. You might ask them to rate ideas and to yeah, even to, to, to vote on certain outcomes. But as you can see here, um, this is a very specific um, understanding of of inclusion, yeah? inclusion in the sense of taking part. But at least in organization studies and management, and but also beyond, I would say there are different understandings of inclusion that not so much, are not so much considered about with just the practice of taking part, but rather asking also the way that inclusion is achieved and who is invited to participate and who is included and who is excluded. So um, there's a, a whole literature actually on organizational inclusion yeah, related and to the, for example, literature on organizational diversity and organizational equality that is completely in, uh, ignored, actually has been completely ignored by this whole openness literature at all. Yeah, so um, and the, uh, the pictures are quite different. So if you look uh, at these inclusion pictures, they are concerned with other questions, such as, for example, what does it mean to be inclusive? Yeah, does it mean to yeah, make, uh, to, to, to have a more diverse set of members in an organization, for example? Or does it mean to adapt your, your structures in a way that the more diverse set of members fits into an organization? But um, it, it's coming from a completely uh, different angle. And so um, we, in, in addition to the question that you have to have, take a normative stance on how transparent and in what way you want to be transparent and in inclusive, uh, this leads directly to the second dilemma I want to talk about, which is the, the, the dilemma of inclusivity. Uh, and this uh, means, and I will explain it in a second, but what is the dilemma here? The dilemma is if you want to get inclusive with respect to certain strands of people, you have to get also more exclusive with respect to others. So the most basic example outside of the openness debate is, of course, affirmative action. Yeah, it's very much under debate already. In, uh, again, I would say in the US, uh, affirmative action meaning uh, some people are given a preferred access to an organization, for example, a university. Yeah? Given limited number of places for students, this means you have to exclude people who would otherwise have gotten the places. So if you get more inclusive with respect to historically disadvantaged groups, uh, that this means you have to exclude people who would otherwise have been included. Um, before I go on here, as a brief commercial break, because what I'm telling here on this inclusion uh, stuff uh, is very much based on research I did together with my sister, who's the actual inclusion expert. So she's a sociologist on diversity and inclusion. And uh, actually what we did together, we joined forces. I brought the openness into the mix and she the inclusion. And so the question that uh, we are addressed uh, in this book chapter, but also in other papers is how are openness and inclusion connected or slightly differently, but um, uh, how connected are openness and inclusion? And this, so far I've uh, presented very general considerations. Let's make it now both the normative dilemma and the uh, dilemma of inclusivity, let's make it now much more specific and concrete with one of the signature examples of open organizing out there that all of you know, that all of you use um, for better or for worse, which is of course the Wikipedia. The free online encyclopedia uh, has its roots in open source, uh, actually originally used open source related licenses, is based on open source software. It's probably one of the most open projects out there. Um, and uh, on its web page, it promises uh, to provide the free encyclopedia that anyone uh, can edit. Yeah, so 
how open is that? You know, anyone. Yeah. So can you be more open than inviting anyone uh, to take part? And if you look at who actually takes part, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the fact that after um, a, an enormous rise uh, of contributors in the mid 2000s, that since 2006, uh, you can see there's a decrease in our stagnation of editor numbers. Yeah, so this is the, actually I just uh, that's off, uh, looked it up today. So the last numbers that the English language Wikipedia, it's very similar for the German language, actually for most large language versions. So you have huge spike uh, in people contributing in 2006 when Wikipedia became mainstream. And then since then it had declined. Um, you can see the decline is less steep for very active contributors, which actually uh, hints also towards maybe some of the problems, meaning that there's a very stable core. There's a very stable core of contributors, but uh, that the, the outer uh, bounds of, of potential contributors, of new contributors, that has decreased or at least is stagnating. And that's important also uh, because at the same time that the number of editors has stagnated, the number of articles, of course, has skyrocketed. So we have, uh, millions of articles in English already. Um, and all of these articles, they need to be updated. So there, there's work to do, even though they are written. Uh, this, uh, of course, as any encyclopedia, also the Wikipedia is constantly um, evolving. So on the one hand, anyone is invited, but very few people actually do. OK, but we know this from all our online research. There is this only 1% are active contributors. On average, 9% are. Uh, uh, at least discussing and 90% are, are, are leeches. Um, but it's not, not the number, not just the number. It's also the composition of contributors. So in, in Wikipedia, anyone can contribute, but that's actually a screenshot from uh, the Wikipedia page on systemic bias in Wikipedia, which is very informative, has a lot of links to current research on bias in Wikipedia. That's also great about Wikipedia. It's so open that researchers around the world, I'm sure also many of you here, love the data it provides. Anyone? Uh, who's uh, working with machine learning, which probably trains its uh, algorithms also with Wikipedia data. Uh, but the problem here is that the average Wikipedian responsible for the content is white, male, technically inclined, formally educated, an English speaker from a majority Christian country, um, from a developed nation and in the Northern Hemisphere and so on. And you get the idea. One could say, yeah, it's not a problem. You know, they, anyone can edit, they are doing it fine. But the problem is, of course, if you um, put together an online encyclopedia and you yourself uh, state the goal to offer a neutral point of view, then this will be hard if mostly male are doing the editing work. Yeah? And actually, there's a lot of research out there uh, that tracks not just the, the all, the, everyone knows the example of biographies and that there are fewer biographies of. Uh, of women than of men. I would say that's um, not the best example because then the counter argument is always close that, yeah, historically and now this is changing. Of course, there are more recent examples also of scientists that Nobel laureates that they even had, didn't have an article. No, but you can see it in, in more subtle ways. So my favorite example is from a study on, on professions in the German language Wikipedia where they looked at what pictures were selected to illustrate professions and uh, they found that even in those professions that are by an overwhelming majority um, uh, female, such as, for example, uh, preschool teachers, yeah? so like or, or kindergarten teachers, uh, that uh, the majority of, of photos of pictures were depicting men. So, uh, and then there are several others. But you, there's also a nice, um, of course, a north-south dimension to this. So these are all geotech, geolocated images in. Uh, Wikimedia Commons as of 2017, and you can see, so the brighter, the more images are tagged. So you can see there's a huge bias here, how bright <laughs> the Wikipedia world is elucidated. Yeah? Uh, also here on this image, if it, where do we have material from? Uh, and what is, what is literally in the dark? Yeah? Because no one uh, went there, made a boat there. Okay, so um, if we revisit the question, uh, or if we want to uh, revisit this opening statement, uh, Wikipedia, the encyclopedia that anyone can edit, why is open for anyone not open enough? Yeah, so why is open for anyone not enough that at least more women 
are, are taking part in the northern, why not at least more white women from the northern hemisphere? Uh, I, I think I didn't mention the number, but there are of course estimates because we know we all can edit Wikipedia also anonymously or pseudonym, pseudonymously uh, with a pseudonym. Um, but the, the estimates based on surveys is that between nine and 20% maximum are female editors in the large language work. Uh, so, of course, there are differences between languages, but large ones, it's in this range. So, why do we um, find this lack of diversity in spite of radical openness? And I would say one of the key theses that I would want to put forward is, no, it's not in spite of radical openness. My main thesis here is, and this has to do with the dilemma of, uh, of actually, of all three dilemmas I'm going to present, but both normativity and um, inclusivity is, we have observed a lack of diversity in Wikipedia because of radical openness. And the explanation is that what we find here are forms of exclusionary openness. And this is not something not restricted to Wikipedia, but actually exclusionary openness is, I would say, maybe one of the, the main phenomena of digital publics overall. Yeah, so what if we think of um, social media, uh, if we uh, and uh, talking from Facebook uh, to over Reddit to Twitter. Um, actually, we cannot be silent on all these things that are happening there on an everyday basis. And that, of course, not all of us experience to the same degree or amount. Yeah? Rather, uh, if you are a white middle-aged male from a northern country, you are less likely to um, be, for example, a victim of cyber stalking or cyber bullying or public shaming than if you are for example, a prominent woman or something like that. So that is, that's a phenomenon that you find in the internet, in, in social media overall. And one could argue, yeah, that's also an artifact that results from the radical openness these social media uh, environments offer, actually. You know, you can also be there um, uh, pseudonymously. You can easily enter. You can... Um, it, but let me say it's not a, not not just an argument that an, uh, anonymity is the problem here. Actually, there are studies showing that anonymity is not even the, the main reason, uh, and that might maybe even people. And if you look at Facebook, where people are with their their real names, so to speak, they are not much more kind to each other there. So it's not about anonymity here, yeah? but rather my argument would be it's about radical openness. Why? Uh, and this brings us back actually to the first domain of openness I talked about: open source software. Uh, where actually this problem is also imminent uh, and very, actually, very hard to tackle. Um, there, uh, uh, there's a study, the last one, I think, from 2017 from GitHub, uh, that tried to find out how many female contributors contributed to open source projects, and they find it's about between 2 and 3 percent. Now, we know, of course, there are less female programmers and developers uh, compared to male developers. But if you look at uh, how many female developers or programmers are working in the industry, we are close to 20, between 20 and 30 percent. Yeah, so the open source software developer share of female uh, developers is much lower than the industry share of developers. So at least there's, there's a hint that openness plays a role here, that openness makes a difference yeah, in terms of if, uh, how inclusive an environment is. And it's so paradox that the more open environment of open source is less inclusive when we talk about female uh, programs. And uh, since this is not new, this problem, this problem has already been observed in the 1990s. Uh, there, uh, Valerie Aurora, she wrote a pay, uh, uh, an article on how to encourage women in Linux, how to. <laughs> and uh, one of the best statements in this text, which I recommend reading anyway, is that she writes, if your group has nine helpful and polite members, and one rude, sexist, loud member, most women are going to continue to stay away because of that one member. And actually, um, I'm not sure how to translate this in, in English, but for the German speakers of you, there's, of course, this famous saying, wer für alles offen ist, ist nicht ganz dicht. Yeah, so, uh, who is open to anything is not entirely sane, but of course, the, the wordplay doesn't work in English the same way. But what that's actually the main argument we find here. The argument is, um, if you are open to anyone, means you're also open to people driving others away. Yeah? And so you're open to exclusionary behavior. Yeah? Not only the people that are exclusionary, but the behavior. So if you are open to anyone, this might, might mean that you're not as open as you want to be, which brings us back to the normative dynamic. Because then, 
actually what Wikipedia tried to also do, and maybe also many people in Wikipedia still con convince themselves they are doing when they say open to anyone. They think they can escape the normative dilemma to take a stance who you want to include and who you want to exclude. Yeah, because of course it's a difficult decision to say we want you and we don't want you. <laughs> so that's not something you want to make. And it's of course very normative. But if you say anyone can join, you can for at least yourself, convince yourself and maybe many others, no, you're you're abstaining from this decision. You don't need to do that because you know anyone can join. If they are not trying, it's obviously their fault. Yeah. But if you look closer, you can see no, you cannot get around this uh, this dilemma of normativity. Yeah? Because if you abstain from taking measures of exclusion, there will be exclusion either uh, either way. Yeah? And so you will exclude people, but you won't even have a debate around it. Yeah? So in the 1970s, there was a very prominent paper by a, a brief article uh, on ex actually uh, informal hierarchies in feminist groups. Yeah, it's called, maybe some of you have heard about it, the tyranny of structurelessness. And the main argument of this article was also that a lot of these feminist groups that were saying, no, we don't want hierarchy. Hierarchy is bad. Actually, it's part patriarchal. Yeah, we, we are all equal. We are all equal. What this actually led towards was that, of course, some were more equal than others. But it was even hard to debate that yeah, because formally everyone was equal. Yeah, so what do you complain about? Everyone's equal here. And to some degree, uh, we find a similar dynamic going on in these open projects. And so the, the following this insight, the question actually is whether, and I would say yes, uh, we, one needs uh, certain routines of excluding exclusionary behavior as a precondition for certain forms of openness. Okay, but this, and this brings me to the last dilemma I wanna talk about, how can you resolve this dual character of openness related routines as both inclusionary and exclusionary. So on the one hand, you wanna you be more you invite more people in, but at the same time, you need rules to keep certain people out so that uh, you get the right people in. The right people are again requiring from you to answer the normative question who the right people are. You cannot get around that. And this brings me to the dilemma of non-performativity. Um, so um, I had a subtitle to explain a little bit what I mean with here. It's about that what we can also observe by research again in, on, on openness, but also uh, on maybe diversity or inclusion, is that talking openness might prevent from walking openness. We all know this saying, how yeah, to walk the talk, but what non-performativity argues that in some cases, and that's different to what I mentioned before, different to open washing, uh, that talking about openness might make it harder to actually achieve certain forms of openness. So what, to, to, to make this distinction clear, because I think that's important, Open washing is actually a deliberate mismatch uh, between how the public expects information to be shared and how an organization actually makes information public. So I would say open washing is like, like green, it's of course an anal analogy to greenwashing, which all, we are all very familiar with now, nowadays. Uh, but open washing means that, yeah, you're saying you want to be open, but actually you don't want to be. That's yeah? so like you're kind of, you know, deceiving the, the public. Yeah, okay. But that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the non performativity of openness. Um, what I'm talking about the non-performativity um, means that sometimes um, you talk about you, you're opening uh, something you're, to, you're talking a lot about opening something you're engaging in, in open talk yeah so, but then you're open but, but whether you're really opening something with this open talk yeah so if you open this door nothing gets more open yeah in, in this setting yeah so uh, what um, what this non-performativity of openness uh, means, and I'm quoting here uh, Sarah Ahmed, she's actually a, a diversity and inclusion scholar. She uh, talks about non-performatives as the, the reiterative and citational practice by which discourse does not produce the effects that it may. So I'm sure you're all familiar with performativity theory by Butler, which argues that actually by speaking in a certain way, you're bringing about certain concepts of, for example, gender. Yeah, so, and it's a very general concept in organization studies that there are certain speech acts that are performative in nature. Yeah, so if I declare, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the conference opened, yeah, then by declaring it, I actually opened it. So it's kind of a performative speech act. Um, and what non-performatives are, are actually the, the, the opposite. Yeah, like you talk about how open you are and how important openness is, 
but uh, people consider by having talked about openness or by considering themselves open, they actually have done the work. And to some degree, that's also true for the Wikipedia example. They argue we are open to anyone. Yeah. So and actually, since you cannot be more open than open to anyone, that's solved. And if there's a problem, we need to. It, the openness cannot be because we are already maximum open there. Yeah. So that actually. And this is not just the, the case in Wikipedia. Other studies I looked at, for example, um, uh, often research cases, the case of the Premium Cola Collective. I'm not sure if any one of you knows that. It's from Hamburg, I guess. It's kind of, you know, yeah. Coca-Cola is evil capitalism. Premium Cola, that's the alternative, very good cola. Yeah? And it's a collective and everyone can take part. Yeah? You can do a lot of studies on diversity, a lack of diversity and inclusion in Wikipedia because there's all this data and there's a lot of interest also by Wikimedia Foundation to address this issue because they want to achieve a neutral point of view. In a premium cola collective, they say everyone can subscribe to the mailing list and be part of the conversation, but of course, who wants to spend his or her free time, you know, doing strategy for a cola collective? I don't know. I, the, but interestingly enough is they, they don't reflect at all how inclusive they or open they actually are because they say anyone can join. And, and so they, they don't even have the data. They don't care about uh, the, the actual inclusivity or diversity of their people, yeah? because you know anyone can join. Yeah? So it's their own fault if they don't do it. So to some degree, uh, it probably is necessary to question routines of talking openness into being, uh, or even the failing uh, to talk openness into being uh, as a precondition for achieving certain forms, certain ways of, as I would call them, then maybe inclusive openness. But what inclusive openness is, is something that you have to uh, decide. And this, uh, it's not just be more open uh, than before. This brings me to my last slide where I want to wrap it up and where I want to actually, what we, what we are offering conceptually is an alternative understanding of openness to the traditional, <laughs> now I'm doing it, uh, traditional understanding of openness as uh, the opposite of closure, yeah? so it's closeness on the one end of the continuum and openness on the other, but rather openness and closure is reciprocally constitutive. Yeah? So what we argue is that openness and closure are inextricably linked and interacting with each other. And actually in all cases of openness, you will always find cases of closure. Yeah? And the, the question is rather not uh, whether you will be, want to be more open or more closed, but rather what kind of openness and uh, you, you want to have. And to answer this question, you will have to operationalize openness into, for example, uh, degrees of transparency and types, forms of inclusivity, meaning which people do you want to have and which people do you want to legitimately exclude? Uh, so analyzing this paradoxical nature of openness and closure, always thinking those two together, not uh, thinking that you can easily move from closure or not so easily move from, from closure to openness requires to establish legitimate closure routines in the sense or with the goal of accomplishing greater openness. Yeah, so to give you one final example, that's not from my own research, it's from uh, a former colleague from mine, uh, Jana Kostas and her co-author uh, co uh, Christian Gray. Uh, she is doing a lot of research on secrecy, for example, and what I learned from her, and it's, it's very intuitive, what I learned from her uh, paper is, yeah, that actually having an official secrecy, and we are right now, I'm not sure whether you follow the news, they also found uh, officially uh, top secret documents also in Joe Biden's former office. Uh, so, but what actually official secrecy is, is actually a transparency device. Yeah, because if you put top secret on a draw, yeah, it, you acknowledge it ex exists, and you can make rules about who has access and who is excluded and how you have to handle it. But if uh, there is no official secrecy, yeah, so it's just in the dark, yeah, so you cannot make rules about it. So you can also make it ex uh, transparent after the fact. So uh, a lot of the things, um, so in, th in this way, this is an example where you close things, but actually to, uh, uh, to maybe achieve some form of transparency, even in matters of national security. Okay, so uh, that's uh, for my talk. I'm looking very much forward uh, to the question. I want to point particularly to my Mastodon account, 
uh, if we talk about openness here. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah.